Now in chapter two, it's really Paul kind of recounting his, his relationship with the Thessalonians, uh, or the church, the church at Thessal Thessalonica, uh, how he got there and, and some of the, those aspects of it. Um, and we know he spent about at least, it says three Sabbath days um, in Thessalonica teaching and preaching. Uh, kind of some speculation may have been a little bit longer than that because of the, the gifts that he was given from the church at Philippi, uh, which is about 100 miles away. We know that they were able to support him twice, uh, at least during that time. But then he was ran out. Uh, he and, and Silas and Timothy um, were kind of ran out by night uh, from the city because so uh, Thessalonica was a free city uh, as far as the Roman rule they had to follow after the Roman, um, the main Roman laws where they were free to have their own magistrates and, and kind of uh, judicial system there. And so some of the Jews, they stirred up uh, the city and stirred up, stirred up these magistrates to try to convince them that they were saying there's another king besides Caesar, that they're preaching that there's someone else. Obviously, they're, they're referring to, to Jesus, um, but using kind of uh, just their deceptive ways the Jews did to uh, try to stir up everybody so they had to leave and they went to Berea and then on to Athens. Uh, but we're not able to spend as much time in Thessalonica as what they would like to, to be able to establish this group and kind of get them off the ground. Uh, but they, they had a, a very good start to it. Um, so what was the, the makeup of the group in Thessalonica? Do we remember what the makeup was uh, as far as the, the new converts? They... There are some Jews, or the, like I said, the Gentile Jews, um, also the Greek converts to Judaism, and then just Greeks who are for, former pagan and uh, idol worshipers. Um, and in verse 3 of chapter 1, remember what were some of the things that Paul had commended the Thessalonians for? And whenever he starts out this letter, he, he gives them a nice greeting, and then what are some of the things that he was saying that they did well and command, commended them for? Their, their faith and their, their labor of love and then their patient hope and the return of Christ. Um, you know, it seemed like Paul didn't really know what to expect after he left this group, especially being in such a, uh, well, I guess the whole region was very full of idol worshiping and then the persecutions that were going to come from the, the Jews uh, at the same time. So he, he was kind of nervous as to what he had left, but he was, he was glad that they still had that faith and, and that love for one another. They weren't without their problems, certainly, um, but they, they were pushing in the right direction and they were, they were holding fast, especially during persecution. Um, what type of reputation had this young church developed uh, amongst other Christians in, in different regions? Read that in verse seven and eight of, of chapter one. Absolutely. And, you know, it gives other Christians encouragement to think this is a very young group. They know what type of, I'm sure their, their climate was very similar and the culture was very similar to, to other places in Asia. Um, and for them to be able to continue in this work, uh, yeah, it, it was very encouraging. We can think about that today. Um, you know, just, I think about, about Caleb up in New York. You know, never been to New York, but there's kind of a reason I've never been in New York. It just doesn't sound like an environment that I really want to be around, but yet for them to be thriving and, and being able to reach as many people and have as many people receptive to the gospel as they have up there, it's, it's really encouraging every time we hear reports like that, um, that people do want to still seek God. And so it's a, the same thing with, with this group as well. And then uh, who did Paul send back uh, to Thessalonica to, to give a report and kind of to check on them? Remember which one of his... His fellow workers were sent there. We know, we know that he sent Timothy back, um, and that's actually how he, he gets this good report and why he is, he is writing this letter. Um, he wrote this, it was presumed to be one of the first letters that he had written uh, to the churches around AD 51, and he, he wrote this letter uh, while he was in Corinth, we, we find out. Um, so that's just a little bit of the background. Um, and also Timothy, uh, you know, he had a, a Greek father uh, and a Jewish mother and grandmother. So that may have kind of influenced Paul's decision as to who to send, send to these folks because uh, he could kind of relate to them maybe a little bit more and kind of understand some of the, um, the more technical aspects of their culture. 
uh, having known the, the Jewish side, like I said, from mother and grandmother, and then the Greek side from his father. Um, so that's, that's just a, a kind of brief review. Uh, so we'll start in chapter two. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Absolutely, yeah. And, and like I said, they're, they're not perfect. Certainly, they have had their flaws like everyone would, but their heart, it's pure. They're still seeking after God. They, their faith, they're still faithful. And, and especially in, the, in light of all the persecutions that they're having, for them to still be doing what they are, yeah, it's, it's very encouraging. Absolutely. So thank you for that. speak much louder than those words I know like you know I try to tell the kids don't yell don't don't hit and all that kind of stuff well I, I yelled at him last night and Carson looks at me he's like we're not supposed to yell I was like, yes yes I know we're not supposed to yell it's like thank you for reminding me of that at least it has sunk in uh, for you uh, so ho hopefully it'll, it'll keep on but uh, yeah that, that example absolutely whether positive or negative it, it is very very powerful uh, for what, what we can have yeah, absolutely um so I, I'd like to to read kind of the or, oh, I was saying the first um, chapter two, the first 16 verses, Paul kind of reviews his brief ministry while uh, in Thessalonica. And it seems he's defending his conduct and his motives. Uh, apparently someone or some, some group uh, had kind of attacked Paul's motives, character, and his mes message was being questioned by some. Uh, why, why do you think someone would, would want to attack Paul's character and, and attack his motives? And who, who might these people have been? Yeah. Right. Yeah. But on the Jews and the Greeks, both of them, you think about the, um, the power. We, we always see, it seems like we, with the Jewish leaders, they're, they're seeking power. They're seeking praise, respect uh, amongst everyone. If you've got somebody coming in to take that away, then they certainly don't like that. And from a financial aspect, uh, I think with the, the idol worship, that was that was big business. And that was some people's complete and entire livelihoods. Um, so if you had somebody coming in trying to pull people away from this idol worship and the practices that were involved with that, well, that's taking customers away. Um, so there are certain people have been slandered for much less uh, than that uh, over the course of time. And think about where did Paul come from? What, what was Paul's background? What, what Before he became a follower of Christ, what, what was he? What, what did he do? He, he was very well respected in, in the Jewish community. You know, say, say that he had studied at the feet of Gamaliel. Um, so he was, and he was obviously persecuting the church uh, as he was on that, the road to Damascus. What was his whole point to go to Damascus? What did he have letters to do? Yeah, to go persecute the new Christians, this new way. Um, and like I said, letters from the elders from Jerusalem to go there and to imprison these folks. Um, so for him to have kind of done a complete 180, I'm sure he made quite a few enemies within the Jewish community during that time. And so it, at every point in the way, um, you know, they, they want to try to slander him as much as they possibly could. Uh -huh. Right. 
text of what I mean, lives of some people. And it's always not even kind of the and he said it was read the Bible, it was read the Paul, it was just a male show in the city, right? Uh it was with respect to the time of it, the time period, the geography, anything to get rid of the And so Paul's constantly trying to establish his credibility. Johnny come later, I didn't get it from Peter, I didn't get it from John, I got it from John. But not only himself, but he's constantly. As a father thinking of these Christians as children, you know, you know the love that we have. Remember this and remember how we treated them. Remember our example of conduct. And uh, how we suffer persecution. We're willing to suffer persecution for you, for all these saints. And the fact that he's willing to suffer persecution, that adds credibility to the message. Right. You know, if you're not willing to suffer for what you preach. You're either a coward or you don't really believe it. Mm -hmm. You're not really convicted. Right. And so it, it, it adds credibility to the message. Yeah, absolutely. And that can be one of the, the greatest, um, I guess, the people they were so confident in Christ and that he was raised from the dead that they were willing to suffer all of these persecutions. Because, like I say, if you don't really believe in something, are you going to be willing to die for it? Probably not. You know, it, well, I would, I would say no, that you're not going to be willing to die for something like that but, uh, and, and endure all these things. So, yes, sir. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I'd like to, to read the first eight verses here of chapter two. So chapter, first Thessalonians chapter two, verses one through eight. It's for, it says, for you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But after we had already suffered and had been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but, but God who examines our hearts. For he never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness, nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ, we might have asserted our authority. For we proved to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our, our own. Sorry. We were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become very dear to us. So we see here, like I said, Paul recounting uh, and defending himself and, and how they, they came to be there. Verses one and two talks about how their coming was not in vain. Their labors were not in vain. Um, and he is so very glad for this. because, Like I said, he puts his life on the line, really, any time that they are, are preaching this new message and, and being hated so much to be ran out of the city. Uh, so to have gone through that, very glad, he is very glad. It talks about the suffering in, in Philippi, um, but yet he was still bold to speak to the Thessalonians. Um, so how, how did they suffer in Philippi? I'm going to go back and talk about some of the stuff from Acts chapter uh, 17. What, what happened in Philippi uh, that we recall with, with Paul and Silas in, in particular? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, had their clothes stripped or torn and beaten with rods and in prison. And all of this was due to uh, casting out a, a spirit from a fortune telling girl um, that and, and then that they kind of stirred up again. It was this mob mentality. Um, they stirred up the crowd. The, the Jewish leaders had them beaten and thrown in this jail. Um, and so we think about the things that they endured. We can kind of turn to our own lives is, is what would we be willing to endure if it meant that the word of God would be spread? We see from their beating and their imprisonment, there is the earthquake. The, uh, the Philippian jailer believes that, that all the prisoners have escaped, draws his sword to kill himself. They call out to stop him, and he calls for the light. He has them brought out of the prison, takes them to his house. Uh, they're, they're able to, to share the news of Christ and the gospel with uh, the jailer and his family, and they believe and are baptized and and start living their life for Christ. Um, so from a bad situation, being in prison and having been beaten to now you have new converts. Uh, like I said, we, we just think about in our own lives. Well, what are we willing to endure 
uh, for the spread of the gospel. And what good, you know, God's providence is always working, even when we don't see it. Uh, probably the, the greatest example we can see in, in Christ and the cross. God's providence is working through that when all of his followers, you know, thought this, this is terrible. Uh, you can see them locked in a, in a room uh, after, after uh, Christ had, had been killed. And they think that pretty much everything has fallen apart, but then he's raised. And so that gives them that hope and that gives them this um, conviction to be able to go out and, and to endure all of these things. Um, so in this, Paul telling this uh, about the suffering in Philippi, does that give me any type of foreshadowing or anything for the church at Thessalonica or for anything that might happen to them? You know, it doesn't seem like Paul paints this rosy picture all the time that uh, as soon as you turn your life over to Christ and you begin following Christ, that everything is going to be great. You know, he, he is very open, and I'm sure that his body probably showed these physical signs as well of what he had endured and, and the other disciples had endured. Um, so he doesn't, doesn't give a false message, a, a false hope that life will be easy as a new Christian. So um, when we think about that, you know, it's also important for us to not to give false hope to new Christians uh, as far as, you know, strengthening them after they come up from the water of baptism. Say, after, after the water's dried, you don't just say, best of luck to you. I hope everything goes well. Yes, sir, Mr. Nixon. And so, you know, Paul's still establishing you know, legitimacy, credibility, he's still establishing a relationship. You can't do it that long. So he's still working on that. No doubt someone's questioning his motives, and he's just saying, look, it wasn't for money because we labor just like everybody else. We worked hard to support ourselves. So we weren't there for money. Uh, we weren't there for comfort. Because look at the persecution we endured, look at the pain we did after the pain. So, what would our motive possibly be other than the glory of God and His Yes. And anywhere He would go. Right. And His love for God and love for these, these new converts and these folks. Yeah, that's why He is enduring all of this that He does. Yeah, absolutely. And that was very different from the culture of the time. Like I said, what, what did these Jewish leaders uh, typically want? They wanted this praise. They wanted the, um, I guess, kind of the, the glory, a lot of it to themselves, as opposed to serving God the way that they, they were supposed to be. Uh, so, yes, it was very different. And a lot of times when you see, even now today, something that is different, it's bad. Um, so that, that's kind of why people were attacking him and, and using this reputation. They think, oh, well, you're doing something different, so you must have some impure motive somewhere. We just can't quite figure it out yet, but, but certainly there's something wrong with him. Absolutely. Um, but I, I say, going back to also that point of, of new Christians today, that's, that's why it is certainly so important to continue to, to help them, um, especially if somebody who wasn't raised in, in a family or doesn't have actual blood relative family that, um, that are Christians, you know, they're, they're going to have a completely different lifestyle from whenever they had their old life and now they have their life with Christ. And there's still going to be things that are intertwining with that, just as we see with the Thessalonians. And so they're, they're, that's why there's that term, babes in Christ. Uh, they are like a, a newborn baby. You've got to bring them up, got to be with them uh, and help strengthen them throughout, throughout the difficulties and, and be patient with them as well. Um, because it, it, you're not going to know everything overnight. I don't know everything. That there's there's no one in this room who who has everything figured out. I, I guarantee it. Um, so we all are. It's a constant growing, constant process of growth uh, for our entire lives. No, no matter how old we become. So, any other thoughts or questions, comments on any of that so far? So we'll move, um, looking at verses three through six, talking about how Paul is defending his conduct, um, so the exhortation and urging that they gave was not an error, uh, impurity, or deceitful, but it was approved by God to deliver that message. And, and they're not speaking to please men, again, the Jews, because if they were speaking to please men, would they have had these persecutions that were, were coming on them? Uh, you can imagine they certainly wouldn't, and they didn't soften anything either. We, we have to be very careful with that today. You in our speech, we, we can't deviate or soften the word of God. That's not to say that you beat somebody over the head with something, but 
Uh, you certainly say it out of, of pure motives, out of love, out of respect and kindness, but you can't twist and turn the word of God just to make it fit you know, the, the group that, that you want it to be. Uh, the word of God is, is everlasting. It, it was the same message that Paul preached then, and it should be the same message that, that we have today as well. Um, like I said, be, be careful for our own motives um, and not say things Paul talks about in verse five about the flattering words. He didn't use flattering words to say something because he thought it would persuade people that he could kind of entice people with a certain, uh, I guess, certain line of, of thinking, uh, even though it deviated from what, what the inspired word was and what the Holy Spirit had, had given them to continue to, to preach. Um, and talks, Paul talks about his authority with the not asserting his own authority as an apostle or seeking the glory for men. Paul was a servant. Uh, he, Christ gave that example of servitude, even though uh, Paul was, was an apostle born out, born out of due time. Um, he, they still knew there was that servitude that, that Christ had, that, and that was what he was trying to emulate, and obviously he had, had turned his life over to. So in verses 7 and 8, um, it says, so who, is, who or what does Paul liken his work to the Thessalonians to? What type of analogy did he uh, liken that relationship to in verses 7 and, and 8? A mother and child. So we, we all can you know, relate to that. You know, it's that caring for that um, you know, a child is completely 100% dependent on food, shelter, comfort. Uh, from mother and from parents. And so we see that very tender, loving relationship that, that Paul has towards these folks. Um, and while I'm sure it deeply pained him to know that they were going through these sufferings, but yet it gave him such joy and such comfort to know that they were still being faithful during all of this time. Um, and you're always very proud when your, your children do something that is good. And it's like, I said, you, you beat it into their head so many times and just say it over and over and over. And you see them doing something good. And you're like, ah, finally, some, something is, is working good. So you have that pride uh, in them. And, and Paul certainly had that, that same type of relationship and feelings. Um, and that's why he was so pleased to share the gospel uh, of God and, and to give himself to them. And it's just that very selfless nature, which we see like with a, a mother-child relationship, very selfless, uh, what would the parents have? All right. Uh, then we'll go to verses uh, 9 through 13. Would, would somebody like to read that to, to give my voice a, a break? 2 Thessalonians 9 through 13. Mr. Jeff, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, again, Paul is retelling uh, both the physical and spiritual labors that they had while at Thessalonica, talking about them working night and day uh, to not become a burden to them. Uh, I don't know what the financial situation was of a lot of these folks. Um, I know that we, we see in other instances where whenever people do you know, are, are converted and, and they believe in Christ and they start following this new way, um, they have financial hardships. A lot of them, they lose their jobs or they, they maybe had type of jobs that does not coincide. You know, they, they can't do it anymore. Um, you know, whether it be they were idol makers, you know, they were wood carvers, metal forgers, um, worked in the temples somehow, um, or if they, you know, the, the Jews kind of shut them out financially. So like I said, I don't know what, what a lot of their um, situations were, but Paul, Silas, and Timothy did not want to be a physical burden on them. And so that's when we also see the support that, that comes from Philippi um, that they, they were able to send down to them. 
but they were constantly working. Um, you know, we know Paul was a tent maker, so I'm sure that he um, was doing some of that uh, along the way to, to physically um, provide for themselves. And they didn't expect the gifts from these people and they didn't expect to be waited on uh, while they were sharing the gospel, uh, which I, I said was very different from the way that the Jewish leaders acted towards the, those that they served or were supposed to be serving during this time. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and not, it doesn't feel entitled to, to different things. Um, you know, even today, if we, if we can see situations where someone, you know, we, we, I guess they call it these, these mega churches and some of these preachers that you kind of wonder, it's like you're driving around in Bentleys and finding, you know, personal jets and helicopters and all this kind of stuff. It's like, what are you really after here? And, you know, have your own TV shows. Um, so it is easy to kind of to, to wonder what some of the, the motives of some people can be. And not just in religion, it, it can be in anything. But uh, certainly Paul and, and his companions did not, we're not after it for the money and we're not after it for the fame, the notoriety. Um, and we're, we're willing to endure a lot of the, the physical abuses uh, for it. So yes, that certainly strengthens his credibility. Absolutely. Um, and verse 11 talks about how, so we had already talked about the mother-child relationship uh, in verse eight, seven and eight. And now it talks about how he's encouraged them as a father with their own children. Um, he shows that loving parent-child relationship again. And in verse 12, he's talking about he wants them to walk in a manner worthy of the calling of God. So how much uh, we care shows to those that we teach. And just as it would be with a, a parent to, to child relationship. And we think, can you think about anyone in your past who's invested so much in you, whether it be spiritually, physically, you know, it's any type of teaching and how, and how much that, that mattered to us. Like I can certainly think about many people throughout my life um, who invested in me and tried to, to better me and help me grow. Um, and you're very thankful to those, those people. Uh, so that kind of shows that closer bond that, that Paul and his companions would have had with this group and with all the groups that they, they taught at the time. Um, but it can also be pointed out that no matter how much we invest or is invested in us, it's still that free will choice uh, for all to obey the gospel in their own time. Um, you know, it's not like everyone who has ever been shared the gospel with it receives it. Uh, think about that. I guess like in our, in our own relationships, um, you know, you can be a great example. You can teach children everything that, that you want them to follow, but they still have their own free choice. And, and unfortunately, sometimes children are not going to make the best choices. Adults don't make the best choices. Um, you just have to pray that, that, that hopefully there's still time to turn around and, and make those good choices. Um, any thoughts about that with the kind of free will choices? Um, and uh, verse 13, it talks about how thankful that they accepted the word of God. Um, and then it's actually the word of God and not their words, not their own version of it, the words of men. Um, but it kind of points out how the word of God is active. It's living and it works in those who believe. Um, so it kind of can show back the importance for us. You know, they didn't have the gospel written down. They didn't have this nice collection of books right here in print that they could they could turn to and just carry around at all times. Um, but but we do, and so they they were were studying more. Um, but for us to know the Word of God and spend time spend time with the Word of God, then that's the only way that we are ever going to be able to get to that point where we have those those you know really good examples and have that knowledge to be able to talk to someone whenever those opportunities arise and. Uh, hopefully have a little wisdom to, to impart um, whenever the time comes. So that just kind of continues to point out the, the importance of, of good Bible study and spending time in the Word of God. Any thoughts on those first 13 verses or so? Sacrifice and, and invest his life, his time. Why would you do that? You know, typically, people do that because they want something in return. Right. And 
relationship. And, and Paul makes it clear the only thing I want to discern is God is pleased with you, you to be saved, and for us to have this relationship we have with God. That's it. And he's, he just, he's just discounting all these options. You, know, you may say, well, it could be this, it could be that, it could be this. Look at all the options, all the alternatives. The only possible reason is that I am serving the Lord, I've been sent on this commission, and you are among the call. Mm -hmm. You're among those who hear the call of the gospel and respond it. And I need to go somewhere else and do the same thing there. But we're still in contact. Right. So yeah, he doesn't just preach it and then leave and not really care what happens. So it's not like sets, sets it in motion and kind of backs away. I and mean, we can see that with God. It's not like God just created the world, set it in motion and said, okay, best of luck to you, hands off now. We still have the providence of God working working in our lives and working today. We may not always see it. I know I, I certainly don't see it all the time, but uh, it's there. He's there and we, we can have that faith and trust in him. Uh, yeah, those are, those are excellent points. Um, and you know, those motives are very, um, Op, it's just opposite from, I guess, basic human thinking a lot of times is that you don't usually see somebody. It's always kind of like what it's in it for me. Uh, we, we see that so often uh, in our, our day, and I'm sure they did back at that time. So I'm sure that's why people were able to kind of be suspicious of Paul and, and why some of these rumors and um, the slander was able to take root. But he, he, again, is reaffirming, no, I am doing this out of love. This is why I'm doing this for you. And and so that God be glorified throughout everything and, and not him you know, or his, his traveling companions. All right. I appreciate that. Uh, we're going to read uh, verses 14 through 16 now. So it says, For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you also endured the same sufferings at the hands of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They are not pleasing to God, but hostile to all men hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved with the result that they always fill up the measure of their sins, but the wrath has come upon them to the utmost. Here we see he, he lets the church know that they, they too have suffered and there are other Christians and other churches um, that have suffered as well. Recounts about the churches in Judea of how they suffered for the sake of Christ. We think initially um, after uh, Christ's had been killed and resurrected after the day of Pentecost. The church was established, was growing. And then what happens? We have persecution. But what resulted from, from the persecution in Jerusalem and, and in Judea and that whole region? What, what happened to, to the gospel? It spread. It spread, yeah. It's like the, their intents were certainly not there to, to stamp it out, kind of kind of put it out and suppress it and think, well, if we, if we uh, produce enough violence, then it, it's going to stop. It didn't. It, went out, people fled, um, and whenever they fled, they kept that same message because they were so convicted in what they were going to, what they, what they knew, um, so it's just giving them that further encouragement. Think about it, you know, it certainly can help us if you know that somebody, say you have an illness of some kind, and you know that someone else has either gone through that or is currently going through that, and you can kind of share in those, certainly gives us encouragement, and you can, um, you don't feel so alone. Uh, so it seems like that's what Paul is doing here as well, as he's, he's giving them that encouragement that I know what's happening. I told you this was going to happen. It's happened to others, but just keep the faith. Keep, keep saying strong, and that's what he is so proud of them uh, for doing. And so, and who does Paul blame for the, the death of Jesus and for the persecution of the church in Judea? The Jews, yeah. And he talks about how that's, that was his own countrymen, um, you know, Paul being a, a Jew, um, so this, this is what happened, and Jesus, uh, you know, they, they knew that he was coming, yet they still rejected him, uh, and he was killed by the Jews at the hands of the Romans or the Gentiles, and as he condones those actions of the Jews, that, that it's not pleasing to God, um, and then talk about the Jews, how those actions were a hindrance, but ultimately didn't spread, stop the spread of the gospel, um, reminds them that, you know, Jesus was persecuted and killed by the fellow Jews, uh, just as Paul had been persecuting other, other, you know, the Christians initially had his conversion and uh, the fellow Jews now persecute him, that the Thessalonians will also be persecuted by Greeks. So it's not like just the Jews are the only ones here who are going to be persecuting this church at Thessalonica or have been, you know, their own countrymen, the Greeks, the, the, the folks, that their neighbors, uh, people that they uh, counted as friends, 
have turned on them uh, so quickly. Um, just lets them know that no, they're, they're not alone in this situation. Any thoughts on any of that? Yes, sir, Mr. Eddie. Yeah, Paul talks about the fact that there's the Jews in verse of the message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, in doing so, they fill up the measure of their sin. That same language was used by God when he prophesied to Abraham about Abraham's people coming to the land of Jews. Uh, but at that point, God said the Amorite has not yet filled up their measure of sin. So this is something that was going to occur 400 years later. Uh -huh. But here, Paul, in using that same language, says that they had filled up the measure of their sin, therefore, wrath is going to come on them to the utmost. And that's the theme that Paul's going to return back to in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and, and really expound upon this idea that God is going to punish them because they have hindered the gospel. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. And that's, um, that's the great thing about having people that are so much more knowledgeable uh, in this. Uh, like yourself, that it can bring these things out. So th thank you all for your, for your help with that. Um, yes, that is, that, that's a great point. And like I said, we will see that, that later on. So. Anything else before we continue? Your mm -hmm. theme, yes. Yeah. Um, yes, yes, thank you. Um, and now, uh, so the next kind of section, uh, it comes uh, chapter 2, verse 17, and really goes through chapter 3, verse 10. Uh, we'll pick up reading in 17 and 18. Uh, but we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short while in person, but not in spirit, were all the more eager to come with great desire to see your face. We wanted to come to you, I, Paul, no more than once, and yet Satan hindered us. For those who, for, um, for who is our hope? Oh, I'm sorry, I'll stop right there. Um, so yeah, Paul talk, re recounts of how they were taken away uh, from the brethren, like I said, had, kind of ran out by night. Um, but yet they're, they're physically separated, but not spiritually separated. And we can all think about that. Um, like I said, if you've lived anywhere other than, than one location and known Christians uh, at different places, you, we may be physically separated, but we still have that bond in Christ. We still are, are spiritually connected uh, and, and nothing can, can separate that. Um, and so we see the, the longing that they have to be able to be back with this group and, and the affection that they have. And they are one-minded, uh, they are Christ-centered, they had one goal, to serve God, and one desire, which was heaven. Uh, so like I said, even though they're physically separated, they all still still, still shared that. Um, and so and what, what had kept Paul from coming back to Thessalonica? What does he, he say there in verse 18? What would have hindered him? What or who had hindered him? It says Satan had hindered him, and um, you know, Satan certainly works in in different ways. Uh, but even though Paul had been hindered from coming back at that point in time, uh, you know, he he's still serving God. Went to Berea and then to Athens, uh, and and throughout Acts, we we can read some of the accounts of what happens in in those places. So God is still being glorified. Uh, God is the the message is still being. Uh, proclaimed and, and pushed forward, even though he's not able to, to physically be there. So Satan can put a stumbling block in, in one area, but if you look for another area, then, then you can go and, and serve God some, some way else, uh, uh, just maybe a little different in a different timing than, than what we had. Um, so what, what obstacles can he place before us um, or can we place in front of ourselves that impedes our, our duties as Christians today? What are, what are some things that we can have? Right. 
Yes, right. Take, take kind of has something that separates us from, from God. You're right. I mean, maybe a, a telephone in itself is not a bad thing. It's, you know, you can you do a lot of good with it, but like I said, it can also be a distraction. It can certainly uh, kind of pull you away from from your focus and from what we need to do. Uh, a lot of times, we're on our our own worst enemies, or at least I am, um, with, with the distractions that I kind of put in put in my own life. Um, but yeah, there's everything. Like you, you could, we could sit here for, for days and name things that, that could be distractions and hindrances to us. Um, but at the end of the day, it's it's our own responsibility, obviously, just like it was theirs to, to put those things away and to, to focus on Christ and live that Christ-centered life um, and, and to get into his word more. So thank you, Ms. Mary. Appreciate that. Um, so in verses 19 and 20, uh, it says, for, for who is our hope, our joy, our crown of exaltation? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? For you are our glory and our joy. Um, so how are, how are the Thessalonians the hope and joy of Paul, Silas, and Timothy in, in the presence of the Lord? How, how can somebody else be, be their hope and joy? I'm sorry, how, uh, how are the Thessalonians the hope and the joy of Paul, Silas, and Timothy uh, in the presence of the Lord, as it says in verses 19 and 20? It's 20, it says, for you are our glory and our joy. How can someone else be that? They did. The loyal followers, it's, um, Paul and them, they, they worked hard, and, and they were so happy to see that they are, they are continuing uh, in, in their faith and their love for one another. Yeah, absolutely. And, and this is going to speak to the church's motivation. It's not about what's good for him. But his, the thing that's good for him is when they follow God. Right. It points that glory to God constantly. Yeah, so that's where he that's where he sees that his satisfaction is mm -hmm. personal benefit is for other people being successful Christians. Right. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Like he's still having that same train of thought. Mm -hmm. And he's still laying down his motives as to why why he's wanting to do this and what what benefit he gets. You know, it's not a monetary benefit that he gets, but this is the benefit. <laughs> it's that glory to God. God is honored. And it's not for him to be like. Right. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Any other thoughts about that? We get to, to chapter three. Okay. Um, so I'll read down through through verse ten now. Um, actually, let's do the first four. Uh, therefore, chapter three, verse one. Therefore, when we can endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone. Talking about Paul and Silas. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's fellow worker, and the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you as, as to your faith, so that no one would be disturbed by the afflictions, for you yourselves know that we have been destined for this. For indeed, when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance we were going to suffer afflictions. So it came to pass, as you know. So in these first four verses, again, you know, they had just come from, from Philippi. They had just been beaten in prison. Um, Paul did not paint this, this great picture of, I know what happened in Philippi. I know what's happened in Jerusalem. I know what's happened in these other areas. It's not going to happen to you. It's okay. No, he, he's not going to paint some picture like that. And, and these people are not foolish enough to believe that uh, it's going to happen everywhere else, but it's not going to happen to them. So he, he had prepared them. And that's probably one of the big reasons that uh, their faith had still stayed so strong throughout all this time. They kind of knew some of the things to expect. I know you can't probably physically prepare yourself for, for the type of persecutions that for everything that may come, but at least if you know in the back of your mind this is going to happen, uh, it's a little bit easier to, to prepare yourself for that. Um, and you know, no one looks forward to uh, afflictions, and like I said, can't be fully prepared. But what are some ways that, that we can help and resources that we can give to other to other Christians um, when trials come? It may not be physical beatings, uh, but, but what are some things that we can do to help help one another? Right. 
Right. Yeah. It's that bond that, that we can have with one another as Christians and not even just the, the Christians that we see here on a weekly basis, but, but other Christians that we've known throughout our lives. You think about the, the three chord strand, it's not easily broken. I mean, if you have that unity and that bond, um, then that gives that strength because um, weakness, times of weakness certainly will come for everybody, uh, as we all know. But when we have that relationship with one another, uh, then, then that can hold strong. So absolutely. And was it possible at this time that the Thessalonians, like in Paul's mind, was it possible that they could have left God um, completely once Paul and, and Timothy and Silas had, had left town, kind of been run out? Was that, was that a possibility? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it, it, as short of a time span as he spent with them, it was certainly possible that when all these persecutions came, it may have been too much for them. They didn't really have uh, those, the maturity in Christ. Um, they may not had those uh, mature examples left with them to be able to with, withstand any of this. So we can see why Paul is so joyous whenever he gets this good report from Timothy, uh, that, that they're, the church is staying strong in the faith. Um, but, you know, like any new group of Christians or new Christians in, in general, uh, they still needed more teaching. They needed uh, to have those examples. They needed to let go of some of their own old, old ways. Um, they had some misconceptions, especially when it came to the dead in Christ, what happened wherever someone did die before Christ came back. Um, and each Christian had their own struggle. And they're all at different points in their new faith, just as everyone is here. Everyone is at, at different points in their faith as far as the maturity um, and, and what they go with, with, with God. So, um, when these persecutions come along, I'm certain, I'm sure it certainly affected people at different ways. So well, that's our, our final bell. Thank you so much for all the, um, the uh, comments. I think Matt Hudson's going to teach next week. We're going to be out of town. Um, we'll kind of pick up somewhere around midway through chapter three. Thank you.